Okay, Jean-Francois, are we ready for you? Fine. Hello. Thank you. Good all. afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Would you like to share a screen? Is that how you want to present? Yeah. Okay, awesome. We have, no, now it's time. I was going to say we have one minute, but it is exactly five o'clock. All so right. we're going to start. I'm going to take over the hosting job a little bit because Isabel got to, got to have a little break, a little rest here. So Jean-Francois, shall I introduce you or would you like to do that yourself? Please do it. Do it but yourself. It will I, be a better English than mine. Would you like me to do my best French? Yeah, please. No, 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 no. That's just criminal. <laughs> I don't think we should do that. Okay. Um, Jean-Francois Filleux is a director of international development and export at ProPlast. His background is in food science engineering with a master's in computer applications. He is passionate about climate change and will speak to us today about um, ProPlast and recycling in Senegal. I hope I have got that right. That's perfect. Okay, great. So we have 10 minutes and we're going to time you. Please okay. go ahead. Do, do you see my screen? Yes, we do. That's, that's perfect. Okay, let's go. So I'm really happy to be, to be here with you tonight. Uh, actually, I, I'm speaking from France, uh, but I'm working both in France and, and Senegal. And I, I will talk about um, uh, an adventure with, with being with uh, for 12 years. Um, so um, I will invite you uh, in Senegal to the second city of, um, of Senegal, which is, oh, you see my, okay, it's better like that. Okay. I invite you to, to Thiès, which is the second city of Senegal uh, for 400,000 inhabitants uh, near Dakar, the capital. Uh, and this is uh, when, when you just arrive to, to TS, you see this kind of picture. And you just have to keep in mind that uh, Sub Saharan Africa is one of the fastest growing regions in the world, and waste is expected to nearly triple by 2050. And then um, there is no collection or fast no collection and no recovery infrastructure. So um, this is a real environmental danger. Um, this is a national priority. The president of Senegal said that a few months ago. And, and the amount of waste, especially in urban areas, is increasingly uh, growing exponentially. So, um, well, we, we are talking today, I know about microplastic, but it's well, it's microplastic, but it's plastic in general. And in general, just keep in mind that, well, in Europe, we recycle around 30% of plastic. Just have this uh, average uh, uh, data in mind. In, in Senegal, and most of the time in Africa, uh, we recycle less than 5%. It means that the remaining 95% are burnt, eaten by animals, or just found in the rivers and then in the ocean. So if you, if you want to, uh, I, will, I will add a link in the, in, in the chat, and you can see um, uh, a video that was uh, uh, broadcasted in, in the French TV uh, a few months ago. Um, well, this is this is a context. This is a situation. Uh, what about Proplast? So Proplast um, has been created 22 years ago. So it's uh, it was in, in 1998 by uh, some uh, Senegalese women farmers that decided to to clean up the fields from plastic because it was difficult to 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 work in the field. So they were helped with an NGO. And a few years after, uh, the, the little uh, association became quite a kind of micro industry. And uh, NGO uh, was looking for a private partner. And um, I, I was leading um, a social uh, cooperative. So we created um, in relationship with the Italian NGO, 
Coplast, which uh, has been created as a social business uh, 10 years ago. And, and so now we, we have about 200 employees uh, working in the field of plastic recycling. Uh, in, in our plant. Uh, 2,000 West Pickers uh, uh, collecting plastic all around the country. Uh, and um, we collect about 2,000 tons of plastic um, every year. Uh, well, in, in this uh, period of COVID, it's uh, quite tricky, but uh, it's the average amount of uh, of, of um, uh, and of uh, amount of plastic, um, so we we collect we collect about we are the leader in Senegal and we collect about two percent of the global plastic. Uh, so the the objective is to collect uh, at the source. Uh, you, I remember, I've, I've been. Uh, uh, hearing at all the presentation for the beginning of uh, this really interesting uh, webinar. And um, uh, what I would stress on is that once in sea, it is in the ocean, it is too late. So we really try to collect it from source with any kind of means. We have a lot of business model uh, with uh, you, you can see three cycles, or we have also trucks and, and so on. But uh, the the idea is really to to act and to act urgently because it is really an environmental uh, uh, danger. All that. Um, so um, we we also ob obviously uh, do beach cleaning, and, and then um, we try. To, we have some partnerships with some local industry, and we try to focus on, sustain, on sustainable design uh, and, and try to use this uh, plastic waste uh, to uh, long life product that will not go that will not be single use plastic that will come back directly into the, the into the ocean. Okay, and. and um, so we we have been working for four years on um, uh, a concept that is called waste and hope uh, that that is um, inspired by fair trade. Uh, it's like coffee or or chocolate. Um, we we believe that uh, the plastic that is collected by uh, Proplast has a lot of social impact, environmental impact, and there is a, a big storytelling about that. So we have been working with um, students in, in the UK, in France, in Spain, to assess the social impact and also the environmental impacts. And, and now the idea is to create value with this storytelling. And thanks to art and design, being able to, um, to develop other kind of uh, proper stories all around the world because um, there is so much to do in all these developing countries. So we already have some projects um, very uh, in, in South America, in other parts of Africa, in, in uh, well, it's, it's tricky because uh, of the COVID, but uh, it is our idea to, to develop uh, and, and create partnerships. Uh, so, for example, uh, we, we now work with uh, Elisava uh, in Barcelona and Precious Plastic uh, to, um, to, uh, to, to, to a project uh, re related to school benches uh, for uh, uh, students in Senegal. Well, I tried to be very quick, so I think I I got one minute. Uh, so I am finished. That's true. You ha you have one minute though. So no, that's that's okay uh, for for me. So we will we'll finish uh, one minute uh, before. So it's nice. Okay, great. Thank you, Jean Francois. Then we can uh, leave some extra time for questions, of course, for one extra minute. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, You're let's. Go to our next uh, speaker, who is um, Jean-Francois. I think you have to, or well, maybe I can yeah. do it. Stop uh, my... I will stop that. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Okay, we will go to Mattia next. Are you there? Hello. Hey. Can you guys hear me? 
Yes, hey. we hear you really well. So this is Mattia Bernini. And yes. yeah, should I introduce you quickly? I just have a couple of lines here. From um, yes, if you, if you want, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so you are the head of web design and strategy at Precious Plastic. Precious Plastic is the go-to place online to learn how to transform plastic waste into valuable products. Sounds fantastic. Please tell okay. us more, Mattia. <laughs> I will do. I will do. No doubt. I'm going to okay. try and share the screen. You guys let me know if, if it works. Uh, yes, I see your screen. Fantastic. Do you see full screen now? Yes. Yes. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. I hope you guys are not too tired <laughs> after the whole day of talking. I'm going to try and stick within the 10 minutes. So let's see. So yeah, as you properly, properly said, uh, my name is Mattia and I lead uh, sort of the Precious Plastic team uh, in a number of different areas, including uh, web, design and strategy, of course. So let me start from you know, the one and only reason why Precious Plastic exists, which is, of course, the huge, immense, gigantic, global, universal problem of plastic uh, pollution. And today there's been plenty of people discussing the topic, so I'm not gonna dive into it too much because I don't wanna bore people out <laughs> again with the same things. I just wanna keep in mind the fact that on a global scale, to date, uh, only 9% of all plastic ever being produced is recycled, which is really tiny if you, if you think about the huge sheer quantities of plastic that are produced every year. So yeah, just keep that number in mind. And, and really, that's really what we're working towards with precious plastic, to try and increase that percentage, to try and recycle as much plastic as possible so it doesn't end up in the environment. But when we began working on precious plastic about almost 10 years ago in 2013, we really started to ask the question, you know, why? Why is it that plastic doesn't get recycled? And the answer that we got to is that the knowledge and the tools needed to recycle plastic are very inaccessible and they tend to be also very expensive. So if you wanted to start recycling plastic nowadays, you might need you know, quite a few millions of euros just to get started. And of course that you know, uh, not many people are able to do that. So, so we thought of changing things and really creating a network of people that can work together and collaborate to tackle plastic pollution. So it's not anymore just a few people that are able to do that but democratizing a technology so that you know, bigger and bigger critical masses can, can join in. So we began by designing a set of small machines that can get people started into uh, plastic recycling to really you know, experiment, learn how it works. And these machines are, as you can see, small, small scale. They're very cheap to build. They, are, they tend to be also quite easy to, to be replicated. And they are made with parts that are available globally. So it's not any fancy technology or anything. It's just very easy, uh, low tech uh, approach that we had with these machines. Then fast forward five years, uh, in 2020, we released what we call semi-industrial machines. And these are machines that are a little bit bigger. They require a bit more of an investment to, to be made. And they are a little bit more difficult technically to, to, to build. Uh, however, once you build these machines, you are able to create a business out of recycling plastic. So, you know, you're able to do this in a financially sustainable way so that you can do it more um, and recycle more plastic. And with this machine, you can do all sorts of things. You know, you can create, you know, beautiful chairs, and benches, stools. You can play with patterns. We can, you can play with colors, shapes. You, you can make very precise objects, you can make lamps, you can make construction materials, so you can build beams or bricks, so you can make some little sheds or, you know, art installations. And, or again, you can build more in modular structures so that you can increase the size of your creations. Uh, or again, like in this case, this table that we've done for Jaden Smith is a, is a nine meter long uh, conference table that really shows you how plastic you know, can be understood as a valuable material because it kind of looks like marble and it's a really stunning experience to see this table. And that's really, that really epitomizes what precious plastic stands for. 
you know, precious plastic really tries to change the way that people look at plastic from something that is cheap and disposable to something that is valuable and precious and that we need to take care of. So this is more like the analog uh, part side of the project, the more real life uh, machine building and creating products. But then we also have, of course, all the digital aspect that really enables people to learn, share and connect with each other. And started with our uh, website, preciousplastic.com, which is where you know, people get there, they get inspired, they understand what precious plastic is all about, what we do, what we stand for, our goal, our mission. And they really just, you know, browse around and see what the project is about. Once they want to start, we have an, a whole academy for people where we take people in their plastic recycling journey from zero to hero. So here you really learn from the basics of plastic, how plastic works, melting temperatures, uh, all the way to building the machines, find people that can build the machines for you, creating beautiful products, um, but also like more soft skills, like creating a business plan, pitching your idea to a bank so you can get some money to start your recycling business, finding a market for your products and so on and so forth. So really trying to you know, take people by their hands and really lead them in their plastic recycling journey so that more and more people can join in and you know, try to rise that 9% uh, figure of recycling plastic, of plastic recycling. Then we have our map, which is the place where it's a very crucial tool where people sort of, you know, well, they use a map. So they, they, they kind of find each other, they meet each other, and both on a global scale and on a, on a, on a local uh, scale, which is, you know, really where, where it matters. You know, with people, your neighbors, people in your city, people near you that you can work with, you can collaborate with, you can help each other. Um, then we have the events page. Well, not very <laughs> successful in 2020, let's say, but this is a very useful page where people can post their events and find a like-minded audience that is interested in uh, plastic recycling. Um, another really, really important tool that we released in 2020 is the how-tos. And these are basically step-by-step uh, -step guides that anyone out there that is recycling plastic can upload. So as we know, the plastic pollution problem is a global uh, crisis that we are all facing that we believe needs to be tackled from many different angles, from many different creative approaches. And so it cannot come exclusively from us. You know, the solution cannot come only from us. They need to come from many different angles. And this is what the how-to allows to do, allows people everywhere around the world to tell the world how they are recycling plastic, how they are improving the machines, how they're making a certain product, how they are collecting plastic and so on and so forth. So that the community can, can learn from us, of course, but also from any, everyone else that is working on this. And last but definitely not least is our marketplace, the bazaar. And here is where people buy and sell precious plastic machines, parts, molds, products, raw materials. And this, of course, really helps to create local economies that we hope can boost uh, plastic recycling and also really funnel cash to people that are recycling plastic all around the world. And this is a very important tool and we, we really hope it's gonna grow in the next years. So really to close the cycle, you know, you, someone gets on precious plastic, they learn how the recycling world works. They start to connect with this global community that we have by now. They start to build their projects, build their machines. They create products and learn along the way. And then hopefully in the end, they also share back everything that they learn with the community so that we can all together as a project advance and improve our solutions so that we can increase the 9% uh, of plastic that is recycled. Now, starting to work on precious plastic can be a bit daunting because it's a lot of knowledge out there, a lot of video tutorials, a lot of documentation. It can be a bit scary to start. And that's why we created the starter kits which are step-by-step -step guide that really take you from zero to hero, you know? So from like finding the right space to how to bring together a group of people that wants to work on this, to building a machine, finding someone that can build a machine for you, uh, creating a business model, find, finding the find, funds, um, finding a market for your products and so on and so forth. Really try to uh, make it as simple as possible for people to start a cycling plastic. 
And so all of these solutions, the machines, the products, the digital platforms, the static kits, they create what we call the precious plastic universe. And an important aspect of this universe is that it's fully open source and fully free. So we want to remove as many barriers as possible uh, to start recycling plastic. And that's why we keep it open and we keep it free. And of course, through the year, a big community of recyclers have, have grown around the world. We have tens of thousands of people recycling and hundreds of thousands of people online collaborating. And this army comes from all around the world, every country in the planet. And they are, you know, on a daily basis, creating better machines, improving the machines, making stunning products, and really bringing about the global change that we want to see uh, in the future. So I think I'm right on time at 10 minutes right now. <laughs> I hope you guys got a bit of an idea of what we do. If you do have questions, just bring them up uh, at the end of this panel. And thank you very much for listening. I know you will, must be quite tired. Thank you very much, Mattia. Yes, indeed. Please stick around because we are going to have a little session in a bit where we're going to ask you some questions too. I think some nice similarities um, coming forward between you and our, our first speaker on the panel. So yeah, looking forward to, to chat a bit about that later. Um, indeed, you are right on time. And next we go on to Anthony Burrell. Are you there, Anthony? Um, yes, I am. Hello. Hi. I don't see you yet, but... Um, Maybe Matteo needs, uh, Mattia needs to um, screen share. <laughs> Would you like to share your presentation with us, Anthony? Yes. Um, yeah, I've just got a uh, power uh, keynote to share. Okay. Awesome. Okay, while you do that, um, I'll just say a little something about you, if you don't mind. Um, I don't know where you're based, actually. Where are you now? Um, I'm in a very small village called Wittersham in Kent, which is in the southeast of England. I'm about um, about 10 minutes from the beach and uh, about an hour from an hour and a half from London. And is it snowing there today? It is. Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and very cold. <laughs> yeah, I'm all wrapped up. <laughs> exactly. I feel you. Um, okay, so you have also designed our poster for the Plastic Justice Actions um, Day today. That's so awesome. Thank you so much for doing that. Yeah, pleasure. Um, it was uh, with uh, Raul, who's, uh, who's um, also on the call, I think. So yeah, it was great. But you know, I kind of, um, I just love designing posters. Yeah. No, great, thank you. Um, so, well, what I wanted to say is that you've also done a couple of collaborations as a graphic artist with, um, is it Extinction Rebellion that you've worked with, I understand? Yeah, yeah, I've worked with lots of NGOs. Um, um, yeah, uh, Oxfam and Shelter and uh, Extinction Rebellion. Um, so I've been working with them for the past couple of years. Um, in a kind of uh, sort of yeah just just helping them with with kind of tone of voice and graphic design um so we we launched um uh, an off offshoot of exile called ocean rebellion and that's focusing on um everything to do with the sea um so we we've uh, last last year we uh, we organized a few actions in London, uh, which was quite good. It was sort of, um, there were quite theatrical interventions. So they're almost like uh, street theater really. So I was kind of involved in that, but we've, we've got more things planned for this year. And then hopefully when people can get together, we can actually have some, some uh, actions and demonstrations back on the street. Because I think uh, Extinction Rebellion you know, was launched with it with a huge uh, visual impact, and I think that uh, that's something that we've been missing over the last year is seeing people come together on the streets to you know to protest. Well, you seem to have close connections to Raul, so I'm sure you will call you back to the into the project to help us with more things or be involved in everything we're doing as well. Yeah, definitely. I don't, I don't want to eat too much into your time. If you want to go ahead and share your screen um, with your slides. Okay. Uh, yeah, how, how, do I, uh, how do I do that? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, 
I, I don't believe I've ever done that yet. Um, there must be something at the bottom. Yes, there's a green yes. one that says share screen. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got that. Okay. How's that? Oh. Share screen. We don't see it yet. All right, I've got to. Uh, ba, 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 da, I should have done this before, shouldn't I? <laughs> uh, do you want to carry on talking? <laughs> Anybody? Any jokes in the meantime? I'm a massive fan of Anthony. Nice. I'm so oh, glad to thank be fan with him. <laughs> There was a question to Mattia if the machines were open source. I typed and said that they were open source on the on the web page, but you can complement to that information. I was about to answer. Yeah, I mean, all the all the material is available online. You can you, you have a lot of almost sixty video tutorials, technical drawings, bills of materials, tip and tricks. Really, everything you need to start is there. Of course, we're not gonna pay you for your motors, but <laughs> otherwise, everything that you all the knowledge that you need to start are there. Okay, I think I've turned the screen sharing on. Yes, you're doing a fantastic job. We see um, a lady on the screen. Yeah. Yes. Um, so yeah, so so she, uh, that lady is a suffragette. And this, the photograph is from uh, the suffragette protests about 100, 100 years ago. Um, so I, I um, I just love the typography and the the kind of costume that that's being made out of typography and you know to, to kind of represent this protest um so when, yeah when you see this is from 100 years ago it's just incredible the the sort of power and you know the uh yeah just the sheer bravery of these women so i think that i think the thing about uh, protest graphics in particular is that they change through time and I think visual communication has to speak about the time that we're in. So th these are all um, historic examples. Uh, so this is from the, uh, uh, the sort of uh, the protests in the 60s um, about, um, about racism and rights in, you know, in the uh, southern states of America. So this, this is a very famous example of a very simple graphic um, approach. I am a man. And then when, when you see it within the protest, within uh, all these people holding the same banner, it, it creates such a, a kind of striking and important uh, visual. So I think, I think that's the thing I was, I was mentioning about XR is that because we can't uh, protest out in the streets at the moment, it's difficult to to show that there is a real kind of groundswell of opinion about environmentalism in particular. Um, so so by, uh, by kind of getting out on the streets and, and kind of protesting that way, you kind of get your message across. Um, some, these are some of the posters from the May 68 uh, student protests in Paris. Again, it was a, a, kind, of, a kind of creative led um, protest where visual communication was at its heart. And because a lot of these posters were produced by students and printmakers within the art schools in Paris, they had this very striking, uh, diff uh, recognizable graphic language. This is a photograph of the workshop, the Atelier Populaire, um, the screen printing workshop that produced a lot of this visual material that was that was used during the protest. You know, it's, it was kind of like the social media of its time really. Um, so this is around the same time, uh, late 60s, John and Yoko, um, war is over if you want it. So this is a kind of uh, almost like a fluxus artwork by Yoko that was kind of co-opted by John to, to kind of to promote his message of, of kind of world peace through his through his music. So this campaign was kind of multimedia, you know, it's maybe one of the first multimedia music campaigns in the late 60s. So this very strong statement, war is over if you want it. 
um, you know, it still, still kind of connects with us now, I think. Um, I think a lot of the, these examples that, sh that I'm showing are kind of timeless in a way, you know, they still, still connect with, uh, with us in different ways. And this is a one-man protest by a guy called Stanley Green, who used to walk up and down Oxford Street in London with his one-man protest against lust. So I'd, I just love, he's, he's such a kind of um, curious character, this guy. So th this was in the 1970s and 80s. So he'd walk up and down Oxford Street um, campaigning against everything that he thought was wrong. And people would just kind of ignore him or, or seem as, as quite a sort of marginal figure, really, almost like a comedy character. But he had this little book that he sold, um, Eight Passion Proteins. So in a way, it was kind of like, you know, an early kind of vegan campaigner, you know, kind of talking about something that was incredibly important to him. Um, so I just love that idea of a single one person protest. Um, so this is Sister Carita Kent. Um, she's a, a screen printer and artists are using lots of visual uh, kind of graphic design techniques. And she was also a nun. Uh, so this is in the 1960s in America. So she, she produced lots of um, very bold uh, kind of posters that, that kind of referenced pop art, but also referenced her faith and how, how those two things kind of connected in her work is incredible, I think. Another very courageous woman. Um, and this is Catherine Hamnett uh, meeting Margaret Thatcher in Downing Street. So Hamnett was wearing this T-shirt uh, protesting against nuclear weapons. And when she met Margaret Thatcher, she undid her jacket to, to show this, this message. So it was a very provocative action, especially within Downing Street and meeting the prime minister at the time. So it was to get this, this incredible image that would be shown in newspapers and spread, spread the message of um, uh, anti-nuclear protest. Uh, so this is, uh, I think this is the first piece of kind of protest graphics that I made myself. So this is back in tw um, 2010. And this was the Gulf of Mexico um, oil disaster. Um, so it was a huge news story. And I wanted to kind of make a piece of work about this. And I connected with this guy, Tom Gall, who wanted to kind of print a poster using the oil from the beach. So he went out to Louisiana, uh, gathered oil from the beach and the sand and mixed together. And then we found a screen printer in New Orleans to produce a, the screen print. So you can see on, on the screen that he, the guy's printing with a mixture of sand and oil to, to produce his print. So this was the resulting print that was made. Um, we made a, an edition and that was sold online and it kind of it, it kind of got a decent amount of attention. So this was kind of back in 2010, kind of as social media was, was emerging as a, as a tool for communication. So that, yeah, that was, that was the first time I kind of got involved um, in anything that was kind of connected with, um, with protest really. Uh, this is a recent project for Oxfam. So, um, so we took um, t-shirts, t-shirts. Two were, more minutes left. Sorry. Okay, I'll just whiz through this. So, t-shirts that were um, kind of to be reused and recycled. So, we screen printed on these t-shirts uh, to produce brand new uh, kind of t-shirt designs. So it's kind of like reusing t-shirts that would normally have been going to landfill. Um, so this was kind of protesting and drawing attention to uh, fast fashion and it's, uh, it's kind of um, terrible effects on, on, uh, on ecology. So that was an event that we, that we did in London. Uh, so this is work for XR. So this was kind of part of the the second rebellion, which was in October 2019. So this this is kind of I like to work with a lot with letterpress typography. I think it kind of connects it connects right back to the suffragettes with the use of letterpress and simple messaging and 
very bold graphics. So the, these were produced as posters and used during, during the protest. Uh, as you'll see, so that uh, so this is in Trafalgar Square. So XR occupied Trafalgar Square for a week, and that was a kind of uh, they kind of created almost like a, an installation within Trafalgar Square that was it was home to kind of workshops and talks, and it was like a, a had a kind of carnival atmosphere in the space. Um, so yeah, so there you go. That's what I've been up to recently. Great. Thank you so much, Anthony. Such beautiful work. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Okay, um, we're a little bit over time, but we're going to go straight into our um, question uh, panel session with the three speakers together. Um, there have been a couple of questions in the chat, and I see some of them have already been answered, but I thought maybe it could be worthwhile to return uh, to some of the questions. So. Niels was asking to Jean-Francois, could you elaborate on how far the situation Africa, in Africa is still a colonial uh, relic? Um, okay, I believe that Jean-Francois, you have um, answered that already in the, in the chat, but I thought maybe it's interesting to, between you and Mattia, uh, possibly you work in different contexts. I think uh, Mattia works more in Europe, um, if that's correct, Mattia? No, I wouldn't say so. I mean, okay. we are based in Europe, but yeah. people that start working on precious plastic, they're everywhere. And funny enough, we also have worked with, uh, um, with Jean-Francois. We awesome. just uh, sent a sheet press to them. So now we hopefully going to make lots of uh, uh, chairs and tables for schools in Senegal. If I'm, yeah, uh, I'm actually, we, we, we don't. Yeah, but uh, we've been working together with uh, other person of your team, but uh, I'm happy to, to see you. <laughs> but uh, no, no, actually, uh, uh, so we, we, uh, we, um, it, it answers, it, it is answering also another question. So uh, everybody can, can buy machines or uh, do, uh, can build its own machine from precious plastic. So on our side, we have been working with the precious plastic team um, uh, to, to, to have a, a new uh, sheet press to, to perform uh, school machines for uh, Senegal. So, um, and we have both projects either in Europe and in, in Africa. So it is in all countries. Maybe can I also rephrase the question because I have the feeling that the um, direction this is going is not the correct. I'm trying to sort of um, ask uh, Jean-Francois in how far actually the infrastructure and the um, yeah shipment and yeah also um, production of plastic is something that originates, of course, in sort of um, yeah the Western world and has been sort of been almost um, yeah moved into um yeah other um the global south and i think it it does i think require to sort of think about where this um problem actually comes from so okay so i did not understand your uh your question that's it <laughs> sorry <laughs> okay um well I, if i understand well uh, i i would say that um uh, plastic, we, we already talked about that, plastic is, is a wonderful material. So it is used everywhere. But and, and for a lot of uh, uh, situation, we do not have uh, other solutions than plastic. Uh, but I, I still don't know if I really understand your question. But uh, what, what, what I can say from my uh, experience in, in Africa for 15 years, is that um, African people are more advanced than European people to deal with um, re uh, plastic recycling, even though they are risk less, but they, they, they do it like uh, low tech. You, you know, they, they have issues uh, and it's, it's uh, complicated to, to buy some, uh, um, some virgin fiber so they they will be more eager to recycle and to 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 have some uh, uh, circular economy uh, to 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 use their plastic, uh, and we have a lot of 
we have a, a lot of uh, technology to learn from Africa to be uh, more performant in, in Europe uh, dealing with uh, uh, plastic recycling. I still don't know if I understood well your question. But <laughs> no, I mean, I guess, um, yeah, I can totally imagine that that's exactly, um, yeah, uh, what I'm trying to point to is that um, we can actually learn even more. Um, but I'm also trying to sort of say that um, the idea of the exploitation and the concept of really like, um, yeah, I mean, in the end, plastic is, of course, like an oil-based product. Eh? So I guess um, the concept of, um, yeah, extraction and production, that's a very, <clears throat> um, yeah, Western um, and a very, um, yeah. So it was exported into these countries and sort of um, overlaying the, in, the, the structures and also the local, um, yeah, productions and sort of, so it's, it's, it's in, exported by the industrial world. Well, and with it's uh, the problem. The I, problem. I, will, I would say that fossil fuel is exported uh, everywhere in the world, you, you know? Uh, and we, in, in Europe, we, uh, in France at least, we do not have fossil fuel and we, we import it. The, the, for, for me, when you talk about, uh, perhaps, it's, um, perhaps it's a cultural uh, bias, but uh, when I hear about colonial uh, relict, I, I do think about uh, agriculture, for example. If you go to, to Senegal, you will see that all the agriculture is, um, is peanuts production. So this is uh, because of the history of, uh, of colonialism and they, they lost their uh, primary crops. And this is a real issue. But regarding plastic and regarding fossil fuel in general, it's more like everybody use it because it's, it does not cost so much and it's a very powerful as an energy or as a material. Um, no. <laughs> thank you. Alice, go ahead. Can, can I? It's slightly, it's not quite exactly following on, but um, I think it needs to be addressed. Um, thanks everyone for your presentations. I'm Alice and um, I, uh, I would like to, I mean, what, what I think connects these presentations we've just seen is uh, an incredible kind of distillation process, um, a simplifying and a kind of a reductionism. Um, and I'm just saying that in a neutral way, I'm not saying that in a pejorative way um, of an incredibly complex issue. So Anthony, if I could pick up with you, I adore your work. So we're starting at that point, but so a message like votes for women is pretty clear, right? I mean, it's a simple message, it's a call to action. Um, or at least, um, you know, it, it, an, in terms of an awareness campaign, it's straightforward. But as we've seen this morning with these incredible scientists, um, or this afternoon, the data is so inconclusive on microplastics, and it's so contested, and it's so, it's literally coming in by the minute. So is the best use of art and design to make statements, um, simple statements, even if they're clear, and even if they're compelling, and even if the, the plastics being recycled are nice to look at? Hmm. Or should we in fact be drawing attention somehow to the complexity of the situation um, and maybe using uh, the design apparatus to gather more data in some way? So I'm gonna ask each of you, I guess, to sort of defend your position maybe or question it somehow. Anthony, would you start? Yeah, I think, um... I've got on, I think it's on Thursday this week, we've got another Zoom call with XR um, and there's probably about 10 people involved in that Zoom call and it'll probably go on for about an hour and a half to two hours and it will be a lot of people talking about very complicated issues and kind of how we communicate with people about these issues and, and it gets very, very difficult to then unpick all that and to, to produce visual communication that connects with people. So a lot of the time it's my job just to, to listen to all this information and kind of soak it up and then think of, think of you know, with a, a friend of mine, Dave Bell, who's a copywriter, just to think of very simple 
messages that kind of boil down all this information into something that can be used as you know as a poster or as a post on social media just to connect with people i think um i think the, you know the more you learn about you know microplastics and you know the, the kind of our impact on on the environment then it just it can does seem hopeless you know and it's like you know how, how do we connect with people and make it into something that isn't hopeless that that you know there are there are ways to kind of change manufacturing and you know our own personal choices you know as consumers we've all got you know a huge amount of power in the the objects and, and the materials and things that we buy so so you know being educated consumers is is a way of kind of connecting with people and so yeah i think um you know, I think we, we all think about how David Attenborough connects with people on an emotional level. And I think as visual communicators, we have to connect emotionally with people about these, these things rather than just bombarding people with, you know, with, with statistics that kind of don't really mean anything. I think, you know, our, our connection between the way that we live now and the environment, you know, we're, we're quite disconnected to the environment, especially to the sea. You know, the, the sea is, is seen as this kind of other place, you know, almost like outer space. So, you know, it's our job to connect people with, with things that are kind of quite abstract. Uh, okay, great. Good response. Um, uh, although I certainly wouldn't, yeah, not advocating for bombarding of statistics at all, but rather just a kind of entertaining uh, the possibility of a big fat question mark, you know. Um, but but I, I appreciate the um, uh, your point and, and this idea of hope encapsulated in actually kind of making a statement uh, and and I, and I hear that. Um, but I'd love to hear from the others as well. And another thing I heard very much in the, between you three is, I think you all acknowledge and someone even used this word, making a small dent. Um, so, so yeah, I would ask the question, is it better to make a small dent? you know, even if it is small, than nothing at all. And indeed, um, is, it, is the power in fact in making lots of small dents and connecting them? So in fact, there's a sort of a network situation that arrives. Anthony's just talked about connecting with people. Uh, you guys, Jean-Francois and Mattea are already connected, um, but how can we do more of that? How can, do you, I mean, do you, do you wrestle with these questions yourself about the small, dentedness of your work, Mattia, for example? Yeah, of course. How could you not when you dedicate, you know, 100% of your life to a cause? Of course, you question, you know, what does it mean? Sometimes it feels like it doesn't mean a lot you know, to spend years and decades working on a problem when it seems so big and the forces at play are so gigantic with billions thrown into this industry and, you know, a big sort of monolithic structures that are playing against you. Mm -hmm. However, I think innovation happens in these small dens. I think that's where you can hope to find the, the innovation that will uh, revolutionize an industry and a society. I mean, of course, we do know that it's small, even though we are, you know, sort of a global project with tens of thousands of people that are working on this daily, we know it, it's, it's a dent, of course, but I think that's where, you know, we hope that we can inspire the next generation of, of recyclers or of innovators, of designers to come up with the idea that will hopefully take us away out of this crisis. And I would say I, I agree very much with Anthony because, I mean, people are overstimulated with data and scientists telling them, you know, doomsday scenario. I think we need to simplify this concept so that we can gather a critical mass that will uh, act upon the current reality that is creating these problems. And I think in precious plastic, we do that very a lot when we simplify a message to its core so that you can access bigger audiences because at least you get them interested, you bring them in and then they will dive into the whole thing that is way more complex than what we, you know, in a way presented. But at least then you have a bit of a critical mass of people that, you know, would then act um, 
Yeah. Mm. Does, does the answer? Yes, it's great. I, I, I like to hear you guys almost like restate the basic principles of graphic design and, and um, com communicative and product design once again, um, in, in a kind of um, an era when, when these things have been questioned a lot. And, and we get far away from that sometimes into, into the world of sort of digital scraping and, uh, and, and Excel spreadsheets and stuff. So it's nice to hear that re reasserted. Um, but personally, I think it needs, um, like you were saying, to learn from the innovations that are going on and, and to iterate through these problems and to collect all this, all of this, um, uh, yeah, these small dents yeah. together somehow. And I think that's the real, um, uh, the sort of the hard labor of this enterprise in a way. But yeah, I, I, I I'm going to hand back over to Lauren now because um, I know I don't have a good sense of the timing of all this, but I, I got a good response. So thank you. Thanks, Alice. Um, I think we are already way over time. Um, Isabel, are you? I've been a, a um, naughty, well, we just uh, we've said until six. So yes. I kind of wanted to try to keep it to that. Yeah. Of course, if people still want to ask, there are some, I see there's a lot of things going on in the chat. Uh, there was a question for Anthony, actually, as a designer, do you think that working with brands and companies who contribute to fast fashion, plastic pollution, climate change is right? Or should we focus all our efforts into de designing for change? So. Yeah, I think, I think it, it kind of, um, it goes back to the, those ideas of like small, um, small dents and small nudges, you know. I know personally, um, you know, I won't work for brands that, you know, kind of um, are polluters or, yeah, produce fast fashion or, you know, any of that stuff. And I think it's it's almost, you know, it's up to us as designers and creatives to, to not work with those brands, you know, and to kind of, uh, to make choices that are seen by people and, you know, kind of demonstrate that you can, you know, you can work with smaller independent brands or, you know, kind of, um, yeah, pe people who've got some kind of conscious about, about uh, material usage and things. So, so yeah, I think it's, um, it's only by education that, that people um, are able to make those decisions and to understand that, you know, if, if you're kind of contributing to, to everything you're kind of part of the problem you know it's an old it's an old cliche but it's true that you know if 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 you're if you're involved in in any of this stuff then you're part of the problem you know i think just by by living on the planet you know we have uh, we have certain uh, yeah kind of you know we, we should we, yeah we should live with a with a conscious uh, mind definitely and if i can add to this i yeah. I don't want to tell you how many companies come to us to do projects, you know, the Coca-Cola, the Unilever, the real people behind this massive problem. And they all want to do their marketing greenwashing campaign, you know, and it, it's very hard to say no when you are a small organization with no fundings. However, you have to stay true to yourself and to your mm -hmm. beliefs. Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I think as soon as you accept, you know, that that corporate money, then you know your your position as as a kind of figurehead, or you know, somebody can talk about this stuff is compromised. Mm. To to a certain extent, I mean, I, I totally agree. We shouldn't contribute or or be um, kind of at a part of any sort of greenwashing. But if you could engage with a large corporation and do actual change within a large corporation, the effects that that could have to getting one of the large corporations actually being radically circular and so on could be could be quite large. The question is how how much could you actually uh, influence these large corporations? And I guess that's um, a, a, a bit of a philosophical question. Um, we have to do a wrap up. Um, I am very happy with how this all has uh, panned out. It's been very, very interesting. Uh, everything that's been shared in the chat, I will save into a, a text document that will be shared on the webpage of the project. So, and the whole recording is also on the webpage of the project. So feel free to, will be. Uh, the full four hours will be online in Elisava's YouTube channel from tomorrow morning. And then we'll edit it into smaller chunks uh, further in the future, the next week or the week after and so on. 
but tomorrow morning the whole thing the whole shebang will be will be there um but um meals uh, if meals and uh lauren want to do a, a short wrap up from the project side and then um, I, can... I, I just I've, I've seen a question from peter i don't know if peter's still around calling peter um i thought it was a really nice um question a statement that he that he added here on the chat. Are you there, Peter? Yeah, I, I have it here. Okay. Peter, Peter cannot um, add, uh, open his microphone, unfortunately. Oh, shame. Okay. Uh, but uh, he said that earlier presentations today suggested that the science on the impact of health of microplastics is inconclusive, but some reports suggest that ingested microplastics can physically damage organs and leach hazardous chemicals. Um, that can compromise immune function and stunt growth and reproduction. Later sessions today suggest we should act urgently. Should the lack of certainty be communicated in our project? Is uncertainty also a political tool for maintaining the status quo? I think it was a little bit addressed with the conversation, the, the question that Alice brought up. But uh, if anybody would want to comment on this. I just thought it's something nice to also think about going forward into the workshop days, perhaps like um, how we can take this ambiguous um, ambiguity with us of, you know, microplastics are on the one hand, very dangerous and very harmful, but at the other hand, at the other side, it's something we need to live with and it could also work within our ecosystem. So that's why I just thought it's something nice to take with yeah, us. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think what we've seen today is that we, have more questions and answers, but there's a lot of approaches. Uh, Heather wants to say something, and I'm so happy she's still around. Please go ahead. Yeah, Heather. yeah, I'm, I'm still here. Um, uh, well, the last question was about uh, human health, and you know, toxicology uh, and human health is not the only reason to uh, look at uh, what to do about plastics, you know, and if so, there's lots of reasons to um, to reassess the whole thing. Um, and I could say that in 2013, we had a big European meeting and for three days and the first day, the first morning, they said, let's not talk about why we want to do something, you know, because of effects or, or other, other issues. It's a resource efficiency problem. It's a human rights problem. It's a, um, it's a political problem. It's a ecological problem. And just because it's a perceived problem as well. And so I, I don't want to put too much weight on the human health aspects. We know a lot about plastics and human health from the endocrine disruption chemical side. Um, the particles could be contributing, but we it's going to take a, another few years before we get to the bottom of that. But um, I still think that the, the conclusion from 2013 is this is still there. Uh, people just don't really want to plasticize the planet and our bodies, even if it's even if it's, I don't know, makes our skin look good or something um, like the even if there's a, not such a bad, bad human health effect, I think people are still not going to embrace the stuff as being um, something they want to see clogging up waterways, etc. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think it, it's also a little bit that we don't need to wait until it is an irreversible problem. We already know that it's seeped into everything and a, a little bit I want to um, um, Martin's comments uh, uh, as well. It's not, you can't just take it out of the environment because you also take out uh, a lot of other things that, that this is working with. And it's a little bit this, what I was commenting in the beginning, it's not the environment and the Anthropocene completely separated. We are one. And if we are using plastics, we will be having plastics in the environment. And to mm -hmm. a certain extent, how many how can we manage this in a in a way that we're comfortable with and how how can we continue with that so a lot of questions to move forward the students that are participating in the project will be working with this um intensively for in the next months uh, this week we'll dive into these topics so thank you so much for participating and asking so many questions. Uh, we can leave the microphone open for some some moments if, uh, if uh, we all want to say something else, but uh, but that's a, a, great, a great wrap up, I think. <laughs> Thank you, Isabel, for being such a yeah, fantastic host, hostess. Thank you. I'm amazed that you did that. On schedule today. When I saw that uh, lineup, I was like, "No way!" But uh, <laughs> you did it. <laughs>
it was great. I actually managed to give time, actually. A big congratulations to everybody. It was, I know, 10 minutes is tough, but, but you managed. Very nice. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Bye. All right. Have a good evening. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.